Among the ranks of the German Wehrmacht stood one of its greatest formations, the 6th Army. Renowned for its combat effectiveness and lightning tactics, it was hailed as a pillar of Hitler's war machine. Amidst the chaos and carnage of World War II, the German 6th Army emerged as a formidable force, one of the most effective combat armies of the Heer, dwarfing many of its contemporaries. To provide perspective, Patton's 3rd Army, renowned for its strength, typically comprised around 6 infantry divisions, 3 armoured divisions, and various supporting units like independent armoured cavalry regiments, engineer battalions, and artillery battalions. In contrast, the sheer scale and might of the 6th Army loomed even larger over the battlefield, establishing itself as a veritable monster of its time. Yet, even this behemoth of military power would soon face its ultimate test, with nearly every member of the army facing certain death. The 6th Army, under the leadership of General Walter von Reichenau, emerged on the military landscape on October 10, 1939. Its inception came about through the transformation of the 10th Army, a large force that had previously seen action during the invasion of Poland. As General Reichenau assumed command, the 6th Army inherited a legacy of combat experience and combat capabilities, setting the stage for its future endeavours of the 6th Army. Throughout the invasion of the Low Countries, the 6th Army displayed great combat effectiveness, operating in tandem with paratroopers to dismantle formidable fortifications strategically positioned at Ebenemael, Liège and Namur, key sites in the fierce Battle of Belgium. Its efforts were important in paving the way for German advice. Advancement. As the campaign surged forward, the 6th Army remained a tough force breaking through the challenging defences on June 12, 1940, marking a significant turning point in the conflict. Subsequently, the army transitioned seamlessly to the northern flank, where it provided crucial support to German forces along the rugged Normandy coast, playing an important role in the final stages of the intense Battle of France. The 6th Army, entrusted with a crucial role in Operation Barbarossa, served as the vanguard of Army Group South, thrusting deep into Soviet territory with determination and strategic acumen. However, tragedy struck with the sudden loss of General Reichenau, whose promising leadership was cut short by a fatal aircraft accident while he was being transported for medical care following a heart attack in January 1942. In the wake of Reichenau's passing, the mantle of command fell upon General Friedrich Paulus, a seasoned strategist who had previously served as Reichenau's chief of staff. Under Paulus's guidance, the 6th Army continued its relentless push eastward, navigating the challenges of the harsh Eastern Front with brutal resolve. It was during this fierce period that the 6th Army achieved a significant triumph at the Second Battle of Kharkov in the spring of 1942. Through strategic manoeuvres and coordinated efforts, Paulus and his troops secured a decisive victory, further solidifying their position as a challenging force in the theatre of war. This success not only bolstered morale within the ranks, but also highlighted the 6th Army's key role in shaping the course of the conflict on the Eastern Front. On June the 28th, 1942, Army Group South initiated Case Blue, marking the commencement of the German Army's summer offensive into southern Russia. The primary objectives of this ambitious operation were twofold, to seize control of the crucial oil fields located at Baku, Azerbaijan, and to capture the strategically significant city of Stalingrad, situated along the banks of the Volga River. These objectives were deemed vital, not only for securing vital resources, but also for safeguarding the advancing forces as they pushed deeper into to the Caucasus region. Three hundred eighty ninth Infantry Division, 
I have seen more than my fair share of bloodshed. The battles leading up to Stalingrad have been fierce, each one leaving its mark on both the land and on us, the men who fight upon it. But as we draw closer to the city, there is a sense of anticipation mingled with apprehension among us. Stalingrad looms ahead like a behemoth, its sprawling streets and towering buildings await us. We saw Kharkov, but this city is much larger. The thought of what lies ahead fills me with a mixture of dread and determination. We have been told that victory in Stalingrad will be swift, that once we break through the city's defenses, the enemy will crumble before us. But I know better than to underestimate our opponents. The Soviet soldiers are fierce and determined, fighting tooth and nail for every inch of ground. And Stalingrad are bigger than we have thought, but again we all hope they have backed themselves behind the Volga. How much longer can Ivan fight for? But still, I cling to the hope that this will all be over soon, that we will emerge from Stalingrad victorious and unscathed. I draw strength from the camaraderie of my fellow soldiers, from the knowledge that we fight not just for ourselves, but for the fatherland. In preparation for the crucial assault on Stalingrad, Hitler handpicked the elite 6th Army, led by General Friedrich Paulus, as a spearhead of the operation. By mid-September, following a relentless advance that saw them breaching the outer Soviet defences, the 6th Army found itself within the confines of the city. However, this marked the beginning of significant challenges. Unlike the vast expanses of Russia where German armoured units thrived with their ability to manoeuvre effectively, Stalingrad presented an entirely different battleground. Its urban landscape, characterised by a labyrinth of narrow streets and towering buildings, posed a stark contrast to the open plains the German forces were accustomed to. This shift in terrain demanded a radical adjustment in tactics and strategy, presenting formidable obstacles for the German commanders and their troops as they navigated the treacherous confines of the city. The entire city was a maze, with the relentless aerial bombardment of the city led by General Oberst Wolfram von Richthofen's, which, during the summer and autumn of 1942, stood as the most formidable air force unit globally. Over a span of 48 hours, approximately 1,000 tonnes of bombs rained down on Stalingrad, surpassing even the intensity of the Blitz experienced by London. The precise toll on civilian lives remains uncertain. Stalin made an order that nobody could initially leave the city. You must stay and defend. Many civilians, estimated around 40,000, were taken to Germany as war labourers, while some managed to escape during the chaos of battle, and a few were evacuated by Soviet Soviet forces. By February 1943, the surviving civilian population dwindled to a mere 10,000 to 60,000 individuals. On August 29th, a climactic moment unfolded as the challenging German 4th Panzer Army surged through Soviet lines, breaking through a significant point located 15 miles south of the besieged city of Stalingrad. This bold advance marked a critical juncture in the campaign, signalling the German forces' intent to swiftly encroach upon the strategic heart of the region. Just two days later, on August 31st, 1942, the relentless momentum of the German 4th Panzer Army brought their tanks to the very outskirts of Stalingrad as they reached the vital Stalingrad-Morozovsk railway. This strategic positioning poised the German forces for a potential breakthrough into the heart of the city itself. However, in response to the escalating threat, Soviet General Andrei Yeremenko swiftly orchestrated a strategic withdrawal, pulling back the Soviet 62nd Army and 64th Army closer to the confines of Stalingrad. This tactical maneuver aimed to prevent the encirclement of Soviet forces and to bolster the city's defences against the impending German onslaught. As tensions mounted higher and higher, September 3, 1942, witnessed a significant development as the German 6th Army and 4th Panzer Army finally established a crucial link-up near Stalingrad. Despite this important achievement, their aspirations to breach the city's defences were met with staunch resistance, as Soviet forces fiercely rebuffed their attempts to penetrate the fortified urban stronghold. September 7, 1942, marked a significant juncture as units of the mighty German 6th Army commenced their advance through the war-torn streets of Stalingrad. Fierce battles were now underway in the city, edging closer to the vital shores of the Volga River. 
This relentless push into the heart of the city signalled a climactic phase in the battle as German forces sought to tighten their grip on the strategic artery of the Volga, a lifeline crucial for Soviet resupply efforts. By September 10th, the German 29th Motorized Infantry Division executed a bold maneuver, successfully encircling the Soviet 64th Army south of Stalingrad. This strategic coup further compounded the challenges facing the beleaguered Soviet defenders, severing crucial supply lines and isolating significant pockets of resistance. In a strategic reshuffle, Lieutenant General Vasily Chuikov assumed command of the newly formed Soviet 62nd Army, stationed on the east bank of the Volga River at Stalingrad in southern Russia. Chuikov's leadership would prove pivotal in the gruelling urban warfare that lay ahead, as he endeavoured to rally his troops and staunchly defend the embattled city against the relentless German onslaught. General Friedrich Paulus, the commander of the German 6th Army, launched a fresh offensive on September 12th, directing intense artillery barrages and aerial bombardments in the city. His ground forces swiftly advanced, seizing control of the strategically vital Mamayev Kurgan, colloquially known as Hill 102, which overlooked the city. This elevated position held immense tactical significance, serving as a linchpin in the defence of Stalingrad for centuries. Its capture by German forces precipitated a ferocious struggle for control, as both sides vied for dominance over this critical vantage point. The loss of Mamayev Kurgan threatened to grant the Germans unfettered access to the river, effectively severing the main artery for Soviet resupply efforts and intensifying the pressure on the embattled defenders. So far our push into Stalingrad, let me give you a glimpse of what it's like. It's tough going, I won't sugarcoat it. We're grinding through resistance slowly, taking each block one by one. Sometimes it feels like we're moving through molasses, but we've got to keep our heads up. Our panzer division is feeling the pinch. We're running low on heavy ammo, which puts a real strain on our operations. We're counting down the hours until that resupply arrives. It's like waiting for a lifeline in this chaos. But let me tell you about the guys I'm fighting alongside. We formed a bond that's hard to describe. We rely on each other and trust each other with our lives. It's what keeps us going when things get tough. Sure, there's fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of what's waiting for us around the next corner. But there's also determination. We're here for a reason and we won't back down. We're soldiers after all, and this is what we're trained for. But I hope we take this sooner or later. Many of our best soldiers are dying daily. But we'll keep pushing, keep fighting, until the job is done. That's a promise we've made to each other, and it's one we intend to keep. September 14th bore witness to a dramatic turn of events in the harrowing Battle of Stalingrad as the Soviet 62nd Army launched a daring counterattack at dawn. However, Despite their valiant efforts, the Soviet forces found themselves ultimately repelled by the relentless German troops, who swiftly hemmed them into a narrow strip along the embattled banks of the Volga River. This setback stressed the increasingly precarious situation facing the besieged Soviet defenders, as they struggled to withstand the relentless onslaught unleashed by the advancing German forces. Meanwhile, on the opposite bank of the Volga River, the Soviet 13th Guards Rifle Division executed a bold manoeuvre, crossing the treacherous waters on barges amidst a ferocious barrage of aerial and artillery bombardment. Their objective was to thwart the relentless advance of the German 71st Division and 76th Division, who sought to breach the lines of the embattled Soviet 62nd Army and secure a foothold along the vital Volga River. This desperate gambit reflected the tenacity and resolve of the Soviet defenders as they fought tooth and nail to stave off the encroaching threat posed by the relentless German onslaught. As the sun rose on September 15th, the embattled defenders of Stalingrad braced themselves for another day of fierce combat. German infantry units launched repeated assaults on the formidable Mamayev Kurgan Hill, a strategic high point overlooking the city in a bid to gain a decisive foothold. However, despite their relentless efforts, the German forces found themselves repeatedly repelled by the steadfast Soviet defenders who fought with perseverance to retain control of this critical vantage point. 
The ensuing clashes exacted a heavy toll on both sides, with casualties mounting amidst the chaos and carnage of the urban battlefield. Elsewhere in the war-torn city, German infantry units pressed forward along the rugged terrain of the Tsaritsa River Gorge, inching ever closer to the vital shores of the Volga River. This relentless advance posed a grave threat to the embattled Soviet defenders, who found themselves locked in a desperate struggle for survival against the inexorable tide of German aggression. As the battle raged on, the fate of Stalingrad hung in the balance, with each passing moment bringing the beleaguered city closer to the brink of annihilation. September 17th witnessed a ferocious clash in Stalingrad as German and Soviet forces engaged in fierce combat at key strategic locations throughout the city. The towering Mamayev Kurgan Hill, the pivotal central station, the iconic grain elevator and the soon-to-be-famous Pavlov's house became focal points of intense fighting. Amidst the chaos, German troops pressed forward along the Tsaritsa River, advancing relentlessly toward the vital banks of the Volga River, where Soviet reinforcements were mustering to bolster the city's defences. The following day, September 18th, saw the Soviet First Guards Army and 24th Army launch a daring assault on the German 8th Army Corps at Kotluban, 40 kilometres north of Stalingrad. However, their efforts were met with fierce resistance as German Stuka dive bombers wreaked havoc, decimating 41 of the 106 Soviet tanks committed to the attack. In the heart of Stalingrad, the brutal house-to-house -house fighting continued unabated, exacting a heavy toll on both sides. Undeterred by setbacks, on September 19th, the Soviet 24th Army, 66th Army and 1st Guards Army mounted another desperate counterattack near Kotluban, north of Stalingrad. Yet, their valiant efforts were repulsed by the formidable German 14th Panzer Corps. As the conflict escalated, September 20th saw renewed clashes erupt as Soviet and German forces clashed fiercely at key strategic points, including the Mamayev Kurgan Hill, the Central Station and the Grain Elevator amidst the sprawling urban landscape. By September 22nd, the dire situation in Stalingrad grew ever graver as the advancing German troops split the beleaguered Soviet 62nd Army in half, seizing control of nearly the entire southern half of the city. The relentless German onslaught pushed the embattled Soviet defenders to the brink of collapse. Amidst the chaos on September 23rd, the arrival of the Soviet 284th Rifle Division provided a glimmer of hope as they were ferried across the Volga River to join the front lines. However, their arrival was met with fierce German resistance as enemy troops launched a relentless assault on the landing site. The following day, September 24th, witnessed a devastating blow as the German 94th Infantry Division and 24th Panzer Division effectively annihilated all remaining Soviet units in the southern pocket of Stalingrad, Russia, tightening the noose around the beleaguered defenders. As September drew to a close, on September 26, German troops launched yet another ferocious assault on Stalingrad, intensifying the relentless pressure on the embattled city and its defenders. On September 27, 1942, the German Luftwaffe Unit 3 conducted its final bombing sortie over Stalingrad before being transported back to Germany for glider towing training, signalling a shift in tactics amidst the escalating conflict. The climax came on September 28th as Sergeant Jacob Pavlov and his brave comrades launched a daring assault on the heavily shelled apartment block facing Soleknaya Street, ultimately wresting control from the incumbent Germans. This heroic act transformed Pavlov's house into a symbol of resilience and defiance as the small band of defenders valiantly held out against relentless enemy assaults for 58 days, epitomising the spirit of resistance amidst Stalingrad. October 3rd marked a pivotal moment in the Battle of Stalingrad, as heavy losses were suffered by both German and Soviet forces amidst the relentless push of the German 6th Army, driving the beleaguered Soviet 62nd Army back to the banks of the Volga River. The ferocious intensity of the conflict underscored the high stakes and the desperate struggle for control of the embattled city. The following day, October 4th, witnessed a significant escalation as the German 14th Panzer Corps launched a daring assault assault on the Stalingrad tractor factory, a key industrial stronghold in the heart of the city. This strategic manoeuvre aimed to cripple Soviet production capabilities and further undermine their resistance. 
By October 14th, the German assault on the Stalingrad tractor factory intensified with the relentless aerial bombardment of Luftflotte IV playing a decisive role in aiding the advancing German forces. Over 2,000 sorties were conducted, unleashing devastating firepower on Soviet positions and paving the way for German advancement. The following day, October 15th, saw further aerial bombardment as German Luftwaffe Unit Wayne conducted three bombing raids bolstering the relentless assault on Soviet defences. Meanwhile, German Stuka dive bombers of Luftflotte IV launched 900 individual sorties against Soviet positions at the Stalingrad tractor factory, inflicting heavy casualties and decimating several Soviet regiments. The grim toll of war was evident on October 16, 1942, as the entire staff of the Soviet 339th Infantry Regiment was wiped out by relentless German air attacks in Stalingrad, highlighting the brutal and unforgiving nature of the conflict. As October progressed, German troops made significant gains, seizing control of key industrial facilities such as the Red October and Barricade factories in northern Stalingrad by October 22, 1942. These strategic victories further solidified German dominance in the region and dealt a severe blow to Soviet resistance efforts. Buoyed by these successes, on October 25, 1942, Friedrich Paulus reported to Adolf Hitler that the capture of Stalingrad, Russia, was imminent, projecting that the city would fall by November 10, 1942. In response, Hitler, from his Wehrwolf headquarters near Vinnytsia in Ukraine, ordered preparations for German units to move north once Stalingrad was conquered, signifying his confidence in the impending victory. As October drew to a close on October 31, 1942, Hitler departed from his Wehrwolf headquarters and relocated to the Wolfschanze headquarters in Rastenburg, Germany, as he remained confident that Stalingrad, Russia would soon be under under German control, signalling a climactic moment in the ongoing conflict. November 8, 1942 marked a significant shift in the air campaign as numerous units of the German Luftflotte IV were redeployed from the embattled skies over Stalingrad to the North African theatre of operations. This strategic reallocation of air power reflected the evolving priorities of the German High Command amidst the intensifying conflict on multiple fronts, and confidence that Stalingrad was about to fall into German hands completely. Three days later, on November 11, 1942, a momentous breakthrough was achieved as the German 6th Army succeeded in reaching the banks of the Volga River in Stalingrad. With a frontage spanning 600 yards near the iconic Red October Steel Factory, German forces achieved a significant foothold in the heart of the besieged city. Meanwhile, in Germany, Adolf Hitler, during a Beer Hall Putsch celebration, proclaimed that Stalingrad was on the verge of falling into German hands, emphasising his disregard for the city's name as a factor in its capture. As I gaze out across the Volga, its waters stained a deep crimson with the blood of the fallen, a knot tightens in my stomach. The Volga, so much wider and more imposing than I ever imagined from the photographs, seems to mock our efforts to conquer it. The distant sounds of gunfire and explosions serve as a constant reminder that danger lurks around every corner, and that death is never far away. Our situation isn't great, supplies are running low, and ammunition is scarce. We've lost so many good men already, and every day seems to bring more pain and suffering. The thought of what might happen if reinforcements don't arrive soon fills me with dread. How much longer can we hold on? How much more can we endure? And yet, despite the overwhelming odds stacked against us, there remains a flicker of hope in the hearts of every soldier standing alongside me. We may be battered and bruised, but we are not broken. We will fight on. We will hold the line and we will pray that help arrives before it's too late. 
However, the tide of battle swiftly turned on November 19, 1942, as the Soviets launched a surprise counter-attack north and south of Stalingrad, aimed at encircling Friedrich Paulus's beleaguered German 6th Army entrenched within the city. This daring maneuver caught German forces off guard and threatened to reverse their hard-fought gains. Amidst the unfolding chaos on November 20, 1942, German Luftwaffe Group KG-55 conducted an armed reconnaissance mission over Stalingrad from their base at Morozovskaya. However, the mission was not without cost, as two aircraft failed to return, stressing the hazards faced by air crews operating in the perilous skies above the besieged city. Simultaneously, a second Soviet offensive was launched south of Stalingrad on the same day, targeting positions held by the Romanian 4th Army Corps and further complicating the precarious situation faced by the German defenders. The encirclement of the German 6th Army was completed as Soviet mechanized and tank corps converged at Kalashnodonu, smashing through Romanian defenses and sealing the fate of the trapped German forces within the city. As the siege tightened, efforts to resupply the besieged German troops intensified. On November 25, He 111 aircraft from Tatsinskaya and Morozovskaya airfields in Rostov Oblast flew a total of 75 tons of vital supplies, predominantly fuel into Stalingrad, sustaining the embattled defenders amidst the relentless Soviet onslaught. However, adverse weather conditions on November 26 hindered German resupply efforts as low cloud ceilings and periodic snow showers impeded aircraft operations, exacerbating the dire situation facing the encircled German forces. Hitler's newly appointed Chief of the Army General Staff, General Kurt Zeitzler, found himself in a desperate situation as he pleaded with Hitler to permit the 6th Army to attempt a breakout from the encirclement at Stalingrad. However, Hitler remained obstinate, adamantly declaring, I won't go back from the Volga. Instead of a breakout, Hitler devised a plan to sustain the besieged 6th Army, comprised of approximately 20 German divisions through air resupply missions while simultaneously dispatching relief troops under the command of Field Marshal Manstein to advance towards Stalingrad from the south. Despite the assurances from Hermann Göring, head of the Luftwaffe, that his air force could successfully execute the resupply operations, the plan encountered insurmountable obstacles from the outset. Adverse weather conditions frequently grounded the supply planes, rendering them vulnerable to relentless attacks from Russian anti-aircraft guns and fighter planes when they did manage to take flight. As a result, a mere fraction, just 10% of the essential supplies ever reached the beleaguered troops, exacerbating their already dire situation. Meanwhile, Field Marshal Manstein's relief troops faced their own challenges as they advanced towards Stalingrad. Despite making significant strides and advancing to within 30 miles of the city, they were forced to halt their progress and ultimately retreat to avoid the risk of being surrounded by themselves. Hitler's refusal to entertain the possibility of a retreat from the Volga River, coupled with the impracticality and failure of his resupply plan, contributed to the worsening predicament of the 6th Army and sealed the fate of the German force trapped within the confines of Stalingrad. As the bitter winter tightened its grip, the plight of the trapped German soldiers in Stalingrad grew increasingly dire. Thousands of wounded and starving infantrymen succumbed to the brutal cold, freezing to death amidst sub-zero temperatures that gnawed at their dwindling resolve. Recognizing the urgency of the situation, General Zeitzler once again implored Hitler to allow the remnants of the 6th Army to undertake a breakout to the south, potentially linking up with Field Marshal Manstein's relief forces. Zeitzler painted a grim picture for Hitler, detailing the appalling conditions and the grim fate that awaited the trapped soldiers if action was not taken. However, Hitler remained resolute and unmoved by the pleas of his generals. For him, Stalingrad was not just a strategic objective objective, but a symbol of German strength and determination. The city was to be held at all costs, regardless of the suffering endured by the trapped soldiers. Hitler's unwavering determination to cling to Stalingrad at any price would ultimately seal the fate of the 6th Army, condemning them to a desperate struggle for survival amidst the unforgiving Russian winter. 
Earlier on, as Manstein embarked on his desperate mission on December 12th, racing towards Stalingrad with the knowledge that the Soviets were closing in, the weight of responsibility lay heavy on his shoulders. With each passing kilometre, the urgency of his task became more pressing, the realisation sinking in that time was running out. Arriving just 48 kilometres outside Stalingrad on December 21st, the reality of the situation hit Manstein like a sledgehammer. He knew he couldn't hold his position for long against the advance Soviet forces. Every moment counted and every decision critical. With no direct orders from Hitler to evacuate Stalingrad, Manstein faced a dilemma. He understood the dire necessity of breaking out and linking up with Paulus before it was too late. The fate of thousands of lives hung in the balance, and the responsibility weighed heavily on him, but Paulus, entrenched in the ruins of Stalingrad, made his own fateful decision. Without a direct order from Hitler to evacuate, he felt bound to stay put, clinging to the hope of relief that seemed increasingly distant with each passing day. For Manstein, it was a moment of profound frustration and despair. The opportunity to save his trapped comrades slipped through his fingers, thwarted by the chain of command and the stubbornness of a general determined to hold his ground. As the Soviet noose tightened around Stalingrad, the consequences of Paulus's decision would become painfully clear. The Battle of Stalingrad would drag on, exacting a toll of suffering and death that would haunt the survivors for the rest of their days, and for Manstein the bitter taste of what might have been would linger long after the guns fell silent. December of 1942 descended upon the trapped soldiers of Stalingrad like a relentless onslaught of despair and suffering. It was a month that would etch itself into the annals of history as a time of total hell, where survival became a desperate last gambit. For those still clinging to hope, the sporadic airlifts offered a glimmer of salvation. But for the vast majority, escape remained an elusive dream. Thousands of soldiers found themselves locked in a brutal struggle for survival, with no end in sight. Every day brought new horrors, new losses, and the haunting spectre of death looming over them like a grim reaper. The relentless Soviet propaganda blaring through the city speakers served as a constant reminder of their dire situation. Every seven seconds a German soldier dies, the chilling message echoed through the ruins, a grim tally of the toll exacted by war. But it wasn't just the physical battles that took their toll, the mental anguish weighed heavily on every soul trapped within Stalingrad's crumbling walls. The constant fear, the gnawing hunger, the bone-deep cold, it all conspired to break the spirit of even the bravest soldiers. Amidst the chaos and despair, desperate battles raged beneath the city streets, where soldiers sought refuge in the dark confines of the sewers. There, in the damp and filth, they fought tooth and nail against the enemy and the elements, willing to do anything to escape the cold embrace of death. The thought of Manstein swooping in to rescue them from their plight lingered in the minds of thousands, a beacon of light in an otherwise bleak landscape. But as December wore on, that hope grew dimmer with each passing day, until it seemed as though even the most fervent believers began to doubt whether salvation would ever come. My unit is decimated, mere shadows of the proud soldiers we once were. Friends and comrades lie motionless around me, their lifeless eyes staring into the grey sky above. We fought bravely, but it was not enough. The Soviet onslaught was relentless, pushing us back block by block until there was nowhere left to retreat. I dare not even dream of escape. The enemy surrounds us on all sides, their artillery pounding our positions day and night. There is no respite, no hope of relief. I have seen the desperation in the eyes of my fellow soldiers, the realization that we are trapped, doomed to perish in this hellish landscape. Food is scarce, rationed, down to the barest of sustenance. We scavenge what we can from abandoned buildings, but even that is not enough to fill our empty bellies. Each day is a struggle to survive, to cling to life amidst the chaos and despair. But perhaps worst of all is the knowledge that even if by some miracle we were to break free of this nightmare, we would only be greeted by the harsh reality of captivity or death on the battlefield. The thought of never seeing my home again weighs heavy on my heart, a burden too great to bear. Why me? Why us? And so I sit here, weary and broken, surrounded by the ghosts of fallen comrades. I do not know what tomorrow will bring, only that it will be filled with more suffering and sorrow. In the depths of Stalingrad, 
Amidst the rubble and despair, I have lost all hope. There is no way out hell to this damn war. On December 23rd, Erich von Manstein's troops initiated their retreat to Kotelnikovo from the Stalingrad rescue, where they prepared for their upcoming offensive. The strategic withdrawal marked a pivotal moment as the German forces regrouped to bolster their defences and launch a counter-offensive against the advancing Soviet troops. The following day, December 24th, witnessed a series of critical developments. Soviet tanks launched a fierce assault on the German defensive lines at Tatsinskaya airfield in Rostov Oblast. This airfield served as a crucial lifeline for supplying the besieged German forces in Stalingrad. Despite courageous efforts, the German defences were breached, resulting in the loss of vital aircraft and supplies. Meanwhile, a similar Soviet offensive targeted Morozovsk airfield in Rostov Oblast, but the German forces successfully repelled the attack, preventing its capture. Simultaneously, Soviet troops launched an offensive against the German army group Don near Stalingrad, piercing the lines of the Romanian 4th Army and further escalating the intensity of the conflict. The grim realities of war were starkly evident on December 25th as the Germans in Stalingrad faced their final meat rations, resulting in the slaughter of over 12,000 horses to sustain the besieged troops amidst dwindling supplies. Responding to the escalating crisis on December 27th, Hitler authorised the German Armeegruppe I and Armeegruppe Don to execute a strategic withdrawal of 150 miles to establish a new defensive line in southern Russia. This decision reflected the grim acknowledgement of the deteriorating situation and the need to consolidate German forces in the face of relentless Soviet advances. As the battle for Stalingrad raged on, the Soviet forces amassed a formidable array of seven armies with the sole aim of crushing the German presence in the city. However, before unleashing their full onslaught, the Soviets extended a last-minute opportunity to avoid the impending onslaught. On January 8, 1943, three Russian emissaries bearing a white flag approached the German lines, presenting terms of surrender. Despite the gravity of the situation, General Paulus, acting under direct orders from Hitler reluctantly declined the offer. Consequently, just two days later, the Russians unleashed a relentless barrage of 5,000 artillery guns, followed by a massive infantry assault a week later. The conflict once again descended into a brutal, close-quarters street battle, with the Russians paying a steep price in blood for every inch of ground regained. However, despite their fierce resistance, the 6th Army found itself teetering on the brink of total collapse. Critical shortages of food and ammunition plagued the exhausted troops, who were now confined to two narrow pockets within the devastated city. As desperation mounted on January 24, 1943, the Russians extended another opportunity for surrender. This time, General Paulus, recognising the dire circumstances facing his remaining troops, sent a personal plea to Hitler, beseeching immediate permission to surrender in a bid to save the lives of the beleaguered soldiers. Before this awful situation, on January 10, the Soviets launched another offensive codenamed Operation Ring, aimed at tightening the noose around the German forces entrenched in Stalingrad, Russia. This operation marked a determined effort to further isolate and ultimately annihilate the beleaguered 6th Army. As the Soviet offensive gained momentum, significant developments unfolded over the ensuing days. On January 16, 1943, Soviet troops achieved a significant victory by capturing Pitomnik airfield located to the west of Stalingrad. This strategic conquest dealt a severe blow to the Germans, depriving them of vital supply routes and impeding their ability to airlift provisions and evacuate wounded soldiers. A significant development occurred on January 17, 1943, when the last remaining Junkers Ju-52 aircraft were dispatched to Pytomnik airfield. However, upon arrival, they found the airfield already in Soviet hands. As a result, the aircraft did not attempt to land. This event marked a pivotal moment, prompting the urgent redeployment of Luftwaffe fighters from Pitomnik to Gumrak airport to avoid capture by advancing Soviet forces. January 17 stands out as the sole day when fighters occupied the runway of Gumrak airport, highlighting the shifting dynamics and urgent imperatives faced by the Luftwaffe amidst the evolving battlefield conditions. The following day, 
On January 18th, a dramatic and ultimately futile attempt by three Hu-111 transport aircraft of the German Luftwaffe to land at the small Gumrak airfield in Stalingrad captured the desperate and precarious situation facing the besieged German forces. Despite valiant efforts, only one aircraft managed to land successfully, while the others were forced to jettison their cargo or abandon landing attempts amidst the treacherous conditions. Amidst the chaos on January 22nd, German engineers reported that the small Stalingradskaya airfield located close to the city centre was deemed operational for transport aircraft. However, their optimism was short-lived as subsequent arrivals of He-111 aircraft were met with disaster, with several sustaining fatal damage due to landing gear becoming ensnared in bomb craters on the runway. The last chance for escape lay in Gumrak airfield a distant glimmer of hope in a sea of despair. As we stumbled towards it, the bitter wind cutting through our worn uniforms, the urgency was palpable. Every step was a battle against the encroaching Soviet advance, a desperate race against time. The scene that greeted us was one of utter chaos. Thousands of men, their faces engraved with exhaustion and fear, surged towards the waiting planes like moths drawn to a flame. We knew what awaited us if we stayed the relentless onslaught of Soviet firepower, the slow descent into oblivion. But amidst the madness, there were those who had already succumbed to despair. I remember one soldier, his hands blackened and frostbitten, digging frantically into the snow with fingers that seemed barely human. His eyes were wide with madness, his desperate cries lost amidst the cacophony of war. As we fought our way towards the wading plains, the air was thick with the stench of desperation. German soldiers pushed and shoved, their faces twisted with fear and determination. But for every man who managed to board a plane, there were countless others left behind, their dreams of escape shattered by the cruel hand of fate. The scenes at the last escape were insane. The first-hand accounts are just awful. It was a pit of madness and pure desperation. The deteriorating situation reached a critical juncture on January 23rd, when the German defences at the airfield fell and Soviet troops seized control of the German-held Gumrak airfield on the western outskirts of Stalingrad. The airfield was covered in bodies and hundreds of pieces of German equipment. This loss further compounded the logistical challenges facing the encircled German forces, exacerbating their dire predicament. Hitler's response to the final plea for surrender was resolute. Surrender is forbidden. Sixth Army will hold their position to the last man and the last round, and by their heroic endurance will make an unforgettable contribution toward the establishment of a defensive front and the salvation of the Western world. In a further attempt to bolster morale and inspire a defiant last stand, Hitler conferred over a hundred field promotions upon members of the Sixth Army, including elevating General Paulus to the rank of Field Marshal. This symbolic gesture aimed to instill a sense of duty, honour and determination in Paulus and his command staff, with the hope of ensuring their unwavering commitment to resistance, even in the face of overwhelming odds. Hitler's decision to promote Paulus to Field Marshal was also strategic, as he knew that no German Field Marshal had ever been captured alive reinforcing the expectation of a heroic and dignified end rather than capture. On January 25th, the remnants of the German 6th Army found themselves divided into two isolated pockets, one in the north and the other in the south, within the confines of Stalingrad. By January 28th, the German forces in Stalingrad faced further fragmentation as Soviet attacks divided them into three distinct pockets. In response to this dire situation, Hermann Göring, in a message to Friedrich Paulus, acknowledged the steadfast defence of the German troops, emphasising that their unwavering resolve even if it led to self-sacrifice, would be remembered as one of the most heroic tales in German history. On January 30th, in Germany, Hermann Göring publicly echoed this sentiment, recognising the defence and sacrifice at Stalingrad as a heroic chapter destined for remembrance in the annals of history. Meanwhile, Soviet troops made significant progress, reaching Red Square in central Stalingrad on the same day. 
The following day, January 31st, the southern half of the German 6th Army, depleted of food and ammunition, surrendered. The final radio transmission from this pocket, sent at 1945 hours, concluded with the Morse abbreviation CL, signifying the closure of the station. In a desperate bid to support the remaining troops in the northern pocket, 110 German transport aircraft took off with supplies. Despite the perilous circumstances, more than 90 of these aircraft successfully located the illuminated triangular a drop zone and released their vital cargo. On February 1st, 1943, Friedrich Paulus, trapped amidst the ruins of a department store in Stalingrad, Russia, made the historic decision to surrender the southern pocket of the city along with 14 of his generals. This marked a significant moment in history as Paulus became the first German field marshal to surrender to an enemy force, while the southern pocket capitulated fighting persisted in the northern pocket. Despite the ongoing conflict, 85 out of 108 transport aircraft dispatched to airdrop supplies to the northern pocket successfully completed their mission. The following day, February 2nd, 1943, witnessed the surrender of the last remnants of the German 6th Army in Stalingrad. Simultaneously, a German reconnaissance aircraft was dispatched to fly over Stalingrad, confirming the cessation of all hostilities. On February 3, 1943, 12 He-111 aircraft laden with supplies flew over the northern pocket of Stalingrad before dawn. However, of the 11 aircraft that reached the intended drop zone, only three managed to release some of their cargo as they encountered no German activity in the area. Even amidst the overwhelming tide of surrender, pockets of resistance persisted among some German soldiers who chose to fight to the bitter end rather than face capture. Soviet documents attest to the necessity of eliminating these determined pockets of resistance as some fanatical groups refused to surrender. It's likely that for these soldiers, the prospect of surrender meant facing captivity in Siberia, a fate deemed worse than fighting until death. In one poignant instance, a soldier wrote a final letter to his parents detailing his resolve to continue the fight despite dwindling ammunition and grim odds. He described how he had exhausted the last rounds of his MP40 and was steadfastly holding out in the northern pocket, refusing to surrender. For these soldiers, surrender was not merely an option, it was an unfathomable betrayal of their duty and principles. On February 3rd, 1943, the German OKW, Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, issued a solemn announcement to the German public, broadcasting the news of the devastating defeat suffered at Stalingrad, Russia. The message, delivered over the radio, was preceded by a somber drum roll setting a tone of grave significance. Following the announcement, the broadcast concluded with the poignant strains of the second movement of Ludwig van Beethoven's renowned Fifth Symphony, underscoring the gravity of the moment. The following day, February 4th, marked the beginning of three days of national mourning in Germany in response to the catastrophic outcome of the Battle of Stalingrad. As a symbol of collective grief and reflection, all theatres, cinemas and nightclubs across the nation were shuttered reflecting the solemnity of the occasion and the magnitude of the loss. Moving forward to March 26, 1943, Adolf Hitler conveyed to Benito Mussolini his belief that the Battle of Stalingrad had dealt a crippling blow to the Soviet Union, asserting that the city's eventual fall was inevitable and would mark a turning point in the war. This sentiment reflected Hitler's delusions and optimism about the strategic significance of the battle, despite the monumental losses suffered by the German forces. Of the original 285,000 soldiers that made up the 6th Army, a staggering 165,000 perished in the harrowing battlegrounds of Stalingrad. Another 29,000 wounded and battered were airlifted out to receive medical care. The remaining 91,000 survivors, among them 24 generals and 2,500 officers, embarked on a grim journey through the snow-covered landscape destined for years of captivity in Russian POW camps in the unforgiving expanse of Siberia. Tragically, only a fraction of these survivors, approximately 5,000, would live to see their homes again.
The brutal conditions of the Russian camps, compounded by the retaliatory treatment meted out by the Soviet forces, exacted a heavy toll on the prisoners. The Russians, keenly aware of the plight of their own soldiers in German captivity, administered similar hardships upon their German counterparts, perpetuating a cycle of suffering and retribution amidst the ravages of war. The defeat of the 6th Army dealt a devastating blow to the German war effort, marking not only the first, but also the most significant defeat the Germans had experienced thus far. Comprising some of the finest troops in the Heer, the 6th Army's capitulation at Stalingrad shattered the myth of invincibility surrounding the German military. Following the Soviet victory at Stalingrad, the entire German war machine found itself on the defensive, retreating from territories once thought impregnable. The repercussions of this defeat rippled throughout German society, shaking the faith of both the populace and the high command in Hitler's leadership. Families across Germany were directly impacted, either mourning the loss of loved ones who perished in the battle or knowing someone who did. The collective grief and disillusionment spread across the nation as the once unshakable confidence in Hitler and the war effort began to erode in the wake of the Stalingrad catastrophe. With over 2 million casualties, the Battle of Stalingrad stands as the largest and most brutal conflict in human history. It wasn't merely a clash between German and Soviet forces. The blood spilt in this titanic struggle encompassed soldiers from a multitude of nations, Ukrainian, Romanian, Italian, Hungarian and Croatian troops among others, also contributed to the staggering toll of lives lost. Amidst the chaos and carnage, it's essential to honour and pay respect to all who fought and perished regardless of their allegiance. The Soviet forces in particular displayed unparalleled resilience and determination as they defended their homeland against the relentless onslaught of the Axis powers. Their unwavering commitment to victory ultimately proved successful, albeit at a tremendous cost in human lives. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we conclude our journey through history. I invite you to share your thoughts in the comments below. Your opinions are always valued and appreciated. Thank you for joining me on this historical adventure. Your presence has truly enriched the experience. Don't forget to show your support by hitting the like button and subscribing to the channel. Your engagement helps it grow and thrive. A special thank you to my Patreon supporters for their continued generosity. Your contributions make a significant difference. Be sure to check out our Patreon and Instagram links below for more content and updates. Until next time, I look forward to embarking on our next adventure together. Farewell for now.